Am I, is that still what you think? That that's not something that actually happened? Do you think other things in the Gospels were like that? Possibly. Like what? Um, well, maybe some of the other portents that are, are mentioned at Jesus' death, like maybe the darkness, the temple veil splitting, uh, earthquake. If you were a believer and heard this, knowing that this is a professor at a Baptist university, what would that do to your faith? Are we seeing Christian theology start to crumble? Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. You'll be really glad you did as I have an extra special guest today. Paula Gia is here. Welcome, Paula Gia. Thanks for having me. I asked Paula Gia to help me with this one as the topic is akin to some of his past work. Recently, Mike Lacona, American New Testament scholar, author, Associate Professor of Theology at Houston Baptist University and Director of Risen Jesus, Inc., debated Bart Ehrman, Professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and New Testament scholar focusing on textual criticism of the New Testament in the historical Jesus. They debated on the topic of the historicity of the resurrection. In that debate, Bart Ehrman asked Mike about what I consider one of the most problematic passages of the Bible, the zombies of Matthew. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming up out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. In a few moments, I'll show you his response. Now, I wasn't shocked that Mike would admit that many dead people weren't walking around Jerusalem on resurrection day. No historian, Christian or otherwise, writes of this event other than the author of Matthew. The author claims that they were seen by many. It was Passover, so the number of people in Jerusalem would have been far greater than at any other time of the year. This was the biggest celebration of the year for the Jewish people, and they were supposed to celebrate in Jerusalem if they could. So the fact that these dead people can walk around the capital city and somehow be unnoticed by everyone except whoever reported it to the author of Matthew is problematic. Complicating the problem is the fact that despite this author claiming that they were seen by many, no writing survives in copies to this day recording this event other than the author of Matthew, not even the other gospel writers. I mean, it's one of those things that I couldn't believe that as a believer, I didn't notice how huge a deal that would have been outside of the Bible. And of course, when I was a Christian, I wasn't looking for external biblical sources to try and validate the Bible. I just thought the Bible was true and didn't need it. But yeah, there's a lot of things you, you, you don't expect that, you know, an itinerant preacher and, you know, 12 of his buddies going around is going to make history in general. That's not the kind of thing that makes history. But yeah, looking back, you do think that a lot of people being risen from the dead in the biggest city in the area, that's going to make news, right? Someone's going to, someone's going to mention that someone's going to notice that. And so, you know, you often talk about the um, argument from silence and that's not a good argument, right? Because yeah, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, but, you know, a lot of times that, scales along with how much you expect that that kind of evidence would exist and man oh man this that's it would make news today let's just like if in jerusalem today i don't know how many there were but it sounds like all the saints like many if there's dozens or hundreds of people come to life that's going to be news mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so sorry, problematic but... i think again if you're taking it literally as i did and i think you did mm -hmm. um that's pretty problematic that there's no trace Mike Lacona's answer shows that he does not hold to scriptural inerrancy, but it was a different piece of the passage that Mike does not claim as historical that I found shocking. Let's look at that portion of the debate and discuss it, shall we? You're sort of famously on record for saying that uh, some parts of the Bible didn't actually happen, but they're narrated, they're, they're legendary. I, I don't know what 
I think you used the term legendary. And the, the, the example that you've used a lot is the one where Jesus dies in Matthew, uh, in Matthew 25. And then the, these tombs are opened up and the saints come out. And then after his resurrection, they, they appear in Jerusalem. And um, I, don't, I don't remember if you used the term zombies for that, but I think maybe, maybe I heard that. For, I don't know. Am I, is that still what you think, that that's not something that actually happened? I wouldn't call it legend. I would call it uh, uh, portents, special effects. This is something that was common throughout the Greco-Roman and Jewish literature, mm -hmm. and it's even in some Christian literature. Yeah. And I think that these were just special effects to say something of cosmic, even divine significance has happened. Okay, great. Do you think other things in the Gospels were like that? Possibly. Like what? Um, well, maybe some of the other portents that are, are mentioned at Jesus' death, like maybe the darkness, the temple veil splitting, uh, earthquake, um, okay. th those may be that way. Those um, are things that didn't, maybe I, it, didn't really happen historically. That, that's correct. Okay. And, yeah. like today we say 9-11 uh, was an earth-shaking event. I think that's what was going on with this in Matthew. Okay, okay, fine. So, so um, what, why is it that if you've got one story in Matthew that's narrated as something that happens, and another story that's narrated as something that happens. What, what are your criteria for deciding that this one did happen and this one didn't happen? Okay, fair question. Um, well, I, I think you just have to, to look at it a case by case basis. Uh, you know, I've given arguments in writing why I think it's probable that uh, the, the saints raised at Jesus' death were portents and not really intended to be understood, even by Matthew, as historical. When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, I think you and I both know uh, from the data that the early disciples, when they were proclaiming Jesus was raised, you look at that and say, yeah, they really believed it, that he was raised okay. and they meant for us to understand that. So let me just understand that. I don't, I'm not sure how much time I've got left, probably not much uh, uh, in this life or in this questioning period. But uh, uh, so I just want to make sure the one piece of evidence that you cited was the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul. Paula Gia, what did you think about Mike Lacona saying that the claim of in Matthew of the dead walking around Jerusalem most likely didn't happen? Well, so current me, who is post-Christianity, is not that surprised. Well, it is a little surprising because Mike is part of an evangelical community that doesn't really accept that view, but it it doesn't surprise me in terms of that a historian would would dismiss, you know, miracle claims as having other explanations, of course. And he's only doing this selectively in this one area. But it didn't surprise me then. If you're asking me what, you know, Christian Paul would have thought, uh, Christian Paul would not have been happy with that analysis at all <laughs> and would have insisted that, no, this was meant to be plain reading. You know, as we as we would read it now as modern, our, our plain reading is the way that God intended it to be. Um, I wasn't into that much nuance uh, as a believer, the kind of the kind that Mike is espousing here. Of course, Mike has really put his neck out on the line when he's started saying these kind of things in his recent work. He's talking about a lot of things that to me actually do make sense. If I w still wanted to believe or if I still did believe, but wanted to try and reconcile some of these things, that's a better way to phrase it. If I if I wanted to try and reconcile what what clearly is is strange single source material single source meaning that only matthew talks about the the zombies and the other portents um that that this stuff would be literary devices makes total sense to me so mike talks about a lot of things as being literary devices so for example he reconciles some of the what some people would call discrepancies, as he calls it, uh, time compression or harmonization. So um, I've been, you know, if you watch a biopic of a, a movie of, of something that, you know, happens. So, for example, like the Steve Jobs movie or the social network or or even the new uh, Tiger King series that's going on right now. A lot of those series will compress events or put events, uh, you know, closer together in time or make them overlap or make some of those stuff. Uh, kind of smoother in the narrative because if you want to actually tell someone's real life as a biography, it would take too long. It'd be a little boring, and some you know important elements for dramatic purposes can be brought together. And Mike Lacona argues now that some of the Gospels will do some of that kind of work. Of course, the trouble with that is how far can you go with that, 
And so when we watch a movie, like any, any, any biopic film, the one on Elton John or whatever, we understand that we are seeing something this time compressed because we as a modern audience understands that that's a narrative device that needs to happen to tell a story in two hours. Mike is arguing that the readers of the New Testament would have understood the Gospels that way. The problem is that a modern evangelical like myself, like I was, did not read it that way. I read it as entirely as history. So can these things, I guess the question for every individual Christian is, can these things coexist? And if you're, if you're willing to allow there to be some literary devices, the exact question that Bart asked there, how can you then tell which things are changed for dramatic purposes and which things are historically accurate? You are picking and choosing at that point. Like that is part mm -hmm. of the problem. That's what made the gospels fall apart for someone like me. It was mm -hmm. just like, well, mm -hmm. uh, if this is only 99% true, then what's to say it's own, it's, a, it's any more than 1% true. Mm -hmm. uh, and I couldn't reconcile those things. Uh, I understand that other Christians like Mike are able to hold some of that tension in the balance. Uh, and I guess that's up to any, every individual person. When you talked about this compressed time that specifically brought to my mind the Luke passage, where on Resurrection Day, Jesus appears to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then they go back to Jerusalem, and then they uh, Jesus appears to them again, and this is all supposed to be happening that same, same day. day. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And yeah, is, is and that one of the things that he says is compressed? Exactly. The, the, that passage in Luke in particular is one that he, he harmonizes that way. Um, and so some of the other things would be, so for example, in the, uh, the narrative where Jesus is born, um, uh, they go to Egypt mm -hmm. and then they come mm -hmm. back and the other book doesn't mention it. You know, Mike says, well, that's again, just, that's just leaving out, selectively leaving out details. And um, similarly, in that resurrection passage, do the disciples go to Galilee or don't they? Do they or do they always stay in Jerusalem? Again, Mike harmonizes that discrepancy by saying, "Yeah, this is just compressing time." One book wanted to make a point about going to Galilee; the other one didn't think there's anything of note there, so we just left them in Jerusalem for narrative purposes. I'm hoping I'm not putting words in my mouth, but that's how I understand Mike's analysis of these passages to be. Okay. Now, I found Mike's denial of the temple veil tearing into shocking, and I did so because as a believer, I heard multiple sermons about how important this event was. I was told that it was significant that the veil was torn from top to bottom, that this was supposed to be evidence that God, in fact, was tearing the veil because he, you know, he started at the top, and worked his way to the bottom. And also that this was evidence that God was telling the Jewish people that they no longer needed a curtain between themselves and him, that they no longer needed a priest to intercede for them, that they could come directly into God's presence and they could directly pray to him. And yet Mike says that this event didn't happen. Uh, what's your reaction to this? Well, again, you know, previous me would have thought that's entirely heresy and and would have understood exactly as you i heard all those same sermons about all the symbolism and and of course matthew is the gospel that is seems to be primarily written to jews and seems to be written almost to prove to a jewish person that jesus is the messiah right it's supposed to be connect all those dots for for a jew where the other gospels are less concerned with that but it makes actually a lot of sense to me now looking back at it that for all those reasons, for all those symbolic reasons that, you know, we heard in those sermons, that is an excellent reason for someone to put that in as a portent, to put that in as a special mm -hmm. effect, to put that in, to try and convey the theology of what was happening at the moment. Mike Lacona another times talks about how um, in the Gospel of John, he changes the time when Jesus was killed to exactly the time when the Passover lambs would be killed. The other gospels mm -hmm. conflict about what time of day. Mike again says, yeah, John probably did that a little bit, you know, slush that around a little bit to make a theological point. He was not trying to, at that point, the author of John wasn't attempting to convey exact history about an exact time. 
but to convey a theological point, it sure makes sense to me that the author of Matthew was doing that exact same thing with that curtain veil. He was telling us symbolically what he felt the death of Jesus meant and not conveying a, a an actual event. Does that should that bother a Christian? I think it should. But if you are willing to take scripture as a little more fluid and a little less uh, what I would call inerrant, uh, inerrant is a weird word, is that just Matthew providing extra adjectives for the event, really? So that's up to every and every Christian and every reader to, to determine themselves. But man, it sure is eye-opening looking past it that it's at least as likely that these gospel authors were creating details to make theological points as opposed to making theological points out of actual events. And if you are willing to say that some are from column A and some from column B, I think you've opened a floodgate that it's tough to close. Exactly, exactly. Which leads into my next point, which is, do you think that there can be an honest faith in an infallible, omniscient God that would allow embellishments or exaggerations or portents, as Mike calls them, in the only revelation that we have of his existence. Well, so even the Christian Paul should have had a hat to put on to talk about <laughs> like, two different voices, but even Christian Paul would have acknowledged that there were, of course, 20 or 30 or 40 years of Christianity before the Gospels existed. So it would be tough for even Christian Paul to say, well, those people couldn't have had an honest, genuine faith. I forget your exact wording. Like they had a genuine faith with nothing but the word of other people. They didn't have an inerrant gospel at that point. So it'd be tough to say theologically that that first generation of Christians before the Bible was written didn't have a true faith. Extrapolating to the most of the population, which happens after that, can I would have said no. I was a sola scripture guy. The Bible alone was was good enough and that because the revelation is all we've got um that it needs to be perfect to to be able to say that all scripture is god breathed you know implied perfection even if you go back to perfection in the autographs for those who know what that means you know there are there are plenty of people uh and i recently spoke with frank turek and you know frank is one of these guys that says man we don't he, he tries to say that we don't even need the gospel to oh, really? you don't need the bible to to have if frank you know he throws out that line if someone rises from the dead i just believe what they say which is problematic <laughs> because mm -hmm, of course, there mm -hmm. are other people who raised from the dead in even in the bible i don't does he believe everything lazarus says i don't know but, that's exactly what i was thinking <laughs> yeah um but you know frank throws out that line in his lectures that he gives in campuses you know someone raises from the dead i just believe what they say and if there are other discrepancies, you know, don't worry about those. Now, that might just be his preaching style so that he can avoid some of that talk in, on a college campus about conflicts in the Bible and discrepancies in the Bible and that kind of thing. But, you know, it does seem like there are Christians out there who want to, at least when they're making the case for Christianity, uh, uh, Jay, they want to be able to at least not have to defend inerrancy of the Bible in order to say that Christianity is true. That seems to be the an apologetics trend that I'm seeing. I don't know if you're seeing the same thing or not, but I wouldn't have, the Christian I was wouldn't have helped with that at all. I'm fairly new to the atheist community. I'm com soon coming up on my third anniversary as an atheist. Um, happy, happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it, it's a little early for me to be seeing any trends because I haven't been here long enough to to really to really see the trends yet. Um, oh, I'm just on my I'm on my sixth. I'm twice as long as you, but <laughs> not exactly not exactly a lot of data points yet either. But I didn't realize it was that recent for you. It is. Yeah. What do you think about how this affects the divine hiddenness problem? I mean, if, if we were to take the Christians at their word and that God has revealed these things in a way that has embellishments and portents, I just see this as being all the more that we have a God that we cannot know if, if this is a real God. How do you understand divine hiddenness? Maybe we're not thinking of the same thing. Okay. I'm thinking that how can we know God if we have nothing revealed about him? If the only revelation that we have of God is the Bible, 
and the Bible contains things that we don't know whether they're true or not, that we're having to, to wade through literary devices and portents to try to, to, to pick out which grains of, of what, which portions are truth. I, I'm wondering how we can know this God. How can anyone really claim to have a relationship with this God? Right. I see. Yeah, for sure. Then, then yes, I would say definitely the, so divine hiddenness from my perspective and, and divine hiddenness for those who don't know me or know in general, divine hiddenness to me is the, is the linchpin for my personal label of atheism, believing that at least the Christian God does not exist. Um, is that a you know loving God who wants me to go to heaven if I am completely honest and open and seeking the truth would thereby reveal themselves in a way sufficient to me because uh, normally what a Christian will say is you're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness or you know you're something along those lines to say you're you don't want to believe but I very much wanted to hold on to my faith desperately and was looking for any excuse, no matter how small, to hold on to it. And because I can know my own thoughts, and I've done a lot of introspection about my own attitude and desires and things, can determine for myself, I can't determine for anyone else, but for myself, I can determine that I was an honest seeker. And yes, I would say that this was part of the problem for me as an honest seeker to be able to believe that the Bible was a revelation that should be sufficient for me to believe. Yeah, absolutely. The, the zombie passage was right in there uh, among a bunch of others that were creating that chasm that's too far for me to honestly, intellectually, honestly get cross. Um, so in that way, at least for me, it was, I mean, every Christian will, will treat this differently, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a problem. I have one final question, and we, we've touched on this already, but I, I think there are some aspects to it that, that we haven't quite gotten to yet, which is, personally, I don't see how one can hold to an omniscient, omnipotent, all-loving God without biblical inerrancy. I mean, how can a perfect God, who is unable to tolerate anything less than perfection in his creation without a atoning sacrifice to make up for that lack of perfection, then turn around and allow imperfection in his own word. Jesus is supposed to be the word incarnate. If the word of God is fallible, would that not mean that Jesus also is fallible? Let, let me just play devil's advocate with you a little bit on this, because normally I would okay. just, I could just nod and say, yeah, I agree. And that wouldn't be <laughs> but let me be devil's advocate for a minute. So would you agree that Jesus being the logo spoken of in, in the um, start of John, mm -hmm. Jesus as the logos is not the same as scripture. Like the scripture is separate from Jesus, right? Um, that's a really good question. Um, that that's something I need to explore a little bit more because, you know, obviously the Bible is not Jesus. They are two separate things. But if Jesus is the word and the Bible is the word, are they not supposed to be one and the same in that they are in complete agreement with one another? Well, I think you could, there you could, you could definitely say that the words, the red letter parts would need to be, that would need to be true. Everything that is something that would be a quotation of Jesus, if accurately recorded, would need to be 100% uh, true and accurate. I think, though, you know, we've been talking about literary devices and things here. I think we would all agree that the Bible contains literary devices. Um, it contains, um, it had to speak to its time, right? It had to speak to people. Mm -hmm. it all, and it also is descriptive, not prescriptive. It described things that happened that maybe Jesus or, or God or they're interchangeable, of course that they wouldn't endorse but they in order to record what happened there's things in the bible that you know god doesn't endorse so you, you know you wrap all that stuff up when the bible describes itself the only real time it describes itself is um and i'm gonna forget which book it's in it's in timothy 
Timothy, thank you. Timothy yes, I, I was going to say it's one of the books that I don't believe is correctly attributed anymore. Um, yeah, all scripture is God breathed. You know, what does God breathed mean? Adam, of course, was God breathed. So Adam was perfect initially, but we would all agree that because of sin, that, you know, Adam was no longer perfect after the uh, Apple event. Um, <laughs> so, and also, you know, Christians are quite insistent, you know, there's, there's clearly stylistic problems. There's grammar problems. Like though, some of these things are undeniable from a human literature standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, there's spelling errors. Now, were the spelling errors in the original? We don't know, you know, all those kind of things. But when I was a Christian, I don't know if you were this way, that, that no, it wasn't advocated that God was literally r robotically puppeting someone and taking over their pen and doing it right. that way, right? It was, it was the Holy Spirit coming together with that author, using the author to write this stuff down. And therefore, right. there is room potentially for there to be some humanity commingling with the divine in the scriptures. Uh, whereas, you know, when you said the, the logos, the Jesus being perfect, I think a Christian would affirm that Jesus himself was perfect, but that does not have to translate. Uh, that word of God doesn't have to translate to being the same of all the scriptures. Does that, I, yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's an argument that I would have made. Does that ring okay. at all with you? Yep. That sounds fair. Mm -hmm. um now now that i've said all that you know I, <laughs> I, I, I don't i don't know that i you know i don't obviously buy that the, the scripture is god breathed i see there's much significant more problems with that in terms of authorship in terms of clear in my mind clear forgeries mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and whether or not you accept that what made it into the bible were forgeries there were definitely forgeries happening because the bible itself warns about forgeries being passed around um there we know there were passages that were added later by humans so we can't know to to what extent you know other passages were added by humans so there's there's all kinds of problems that i would encourage a christian to go seek out themselves i just don't know that i would put that logos as one of the primary ones okay that's yeah. fair those were all the questions that i had for you is there anything else um that hmm. you got out of this or you gleaned from this that i might have overlooked let me give that a second of thought and we're specifically focused around the the whole the whole Matthew zombies type thing. Mm -hmm. No, I think what's what I think the most important question that a person can ask themselves is the same one that Bart asked: is if the Bible contains material that is not that was never intended to be historical. And if you go to my channel and watch my interview with Mike before the debate. He admitted that there is literally no way to tell. I asked him that at this Richard point. Victims. And when you're looking at your, your method here, do you find that the empty tomb qualifies as part of the historical bedrock? I don't. Ooh, let's hear that again. Do you find that the empty tomb qualifies as part of the historical bedrock? I don't. Blank. The reason I he don't... He was a little more forthcoming with my channel. I guess the question is... Do you, beyond the fact that the gospels then would contain some legendary development is there anything historically do you think that makes it impossible that some appearances really happened but maybe some are embellished and, and largely legendary hmm. okay fair question um you know i look at the earliest tradition at, at least earliest uh, extant that we have that can date i think that would be the oral tradition in first corinthians 15 verses three through eight right um and that mentions three group appearances three individual appearances uh one to the skeptic paul so you know the gospels have group appearances um of course the oral tradition in first corinthians 15 is not attempting to narrate things it's a letter it's not a biography so do the gospels uh in terms of the appearances of jesus do they contain any legendary elements well that's impossible to know, I think. Uh, Mike admits but... that there is no way to have any kind of certainty which parts are intended to be historical, which parts are not. And even worse, what if you add in that people can be mistaken? 
And if you if your view of the Bible allows that the person could be mistaken, then all of a sudden you open up yet another floodgate of which parts did they believe on insufficient evidence and which parts were they adding and crafting and all those kind of things. You need to take a real hard look at the Bible and figure out whether that is sufficient evidence to believe what you believe. And if you believe based on testimony, is this the kind of testimony that overcomes the burden of the miraculous claims that it says? If you can look at this honestly and still say that the Bible, with while knowing and acknowledging all of these challenges, if you can still hold on to the Gospels as faith that, that works for you, um, at least you've evaluated it, and I, I applaud you. Um, I it, For me, it didn't work. Once I started making all these other considerations, I could no longer hold on. But my challenge and my whole channel is really just to have people not, not I don't care specifically where they land, but I really want them to evaluate because I went so many years as a Christian with these kind of details hidden from me mm -hmm. that I really felt cheated. And I think a Christian owes it to themselves to dig into this, weigh it all out and figure out where they stand on this whole inerrancy thing. If at this point you are scratching your head and wondering why are two atheists talking about how to interpret the Bible correctly? Why do we care about what people who don't believe like us believe? It's this. Right now, the evangelicals and Christian nationalists in my country and even more so in my state are attempting to legislate their beliefs into law, and they are succeeding. My governor is so convinced that she lives in a theocracy that she isn't even shrouding her desire to legislate in her religion into non-religious terms anymore. The evangelicals believe that their way of thinking is the only way to think, and any beliefs other than their beliefs are false. They are so certain that their way is the only way, that they believe that they are doing a good thing and pleasing God by forcing people who don't believe like them to live as though they do. And because they believe this, they want to take away bodily autonomy from women. They want to deny equal protection under the law to gay people, trans people, and anyone else, like myself, who thinks that they are wrong. And the more extreme among them want to take away the vote from women. Days when women had no right. Right, let's bring them back. Let's get back to those days. <laughs> what are you so worried about? What do you think they mean when they say women's rights? You know what they mean? The right to divorce your husband is what they mean. You know what they mean? The right to rebel and disobey your husband. The right to divorce him. The right to go out and get a job and make your own money. The right to tell him what to do. The right to go vote for our leaders as if women should have any say in how our country is run. And put to death anyone who isn't straight. Look, there's only one group that enjoys that. It's the pride parades going up and down the street. Yeah. And you know, it's great when trucks accidentally go through those, you know, parades. I think only one person died, so hopefully we can hope for more in the future. You say, well, that's mean. Yeah, but th the Bible says that they're worthy of death. You say, are you sad when fat die? No, I think it's great. I hope they all die. I would love it if every fat would die right now. So I think it's important for people like Paula Gia and myself to analyze these claims to show that they are not fact-based, as many believers think that they are. And as you see from Mike Lycona here, even they cannot agree on what the fact basis is for their beliefs, as they disagree on what is fact and what is literary device in their book. The sooner that we can show that these beliefs are mere ideas, built not on historical events, but on traditions, legends, and literary devices, that were never intended to be taken as literal historical fact, the sooner we can have real conversations about what is best for everyone, or at least for the most possible. When we reach the point where legislation is a debate over how can we do the most good for the most people, instead of how can I please a God, then 
and only then will we be able to make changes for the better. Thank you so much for joining me, Paula Gia. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me on and keep up the good work and the good fight. And I know you're still on your truth quest, which I admire greatly, as I am as well. So uh, it's great to, that our paths cross every now and again. Okay. Live your life. Thanks. Later.